Okay, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming and being on time. And your reward will be the following, that at the beginning of this class, I will present the short list to prepare for the final exam. The topics and texts that I will use to uh, create the questions for the final exam. I'm also going to uh, discuss what we're going to do in the week and a half uh, that is left some changes are required, but I will start with a simple announcement. Today, after my second morning class, I will not go as usual to my office in the Melvin Library and 3004. I'll go home and I'll be available on Zoom from around 12.15 to 1.15 p.m. Okay. So keep that in mind if you need my assistance. As you remember, I told you that the final exam will include five essay questions and you have to answer four of them, any four of your choice. Two of the questions will be based on chapters, groups of chapters or individual chapters from the prints and in the exam, you will find, with the exam, you will find a packet with uh, excerpts that are relevant for the essay questions you have in front of you. Two more questions will be based on texts on which we spend time discussing the Machiavellian nature of themes, topics, characters in those texts. And finally, one question will be based on the films or TV series that we watched on a Friday. So the short list is the following. For the prints, I'm not going to create a short list. The prints are short enough and it should be easy enough for you to get an idea of which chapters or groups of chapter, uh, chapters I will be using for those questions. As far as the Machiavellian texts, I've decided to make a change. I will not have a lot of time to discuss the last reading from H.G. Wells, the new Machiavelli. Therefore, that text will not be part of the final exam. In place of the new Machiavelli, I've decided to include in the list of readings from which I will base my questions on two of them. I've decided to include the first novella of the Decameron, the novella about Ciappelletto. The other choices for this question will be the 48 Laws of Power, Princessa, and Benigna Machiavelli. So, of course, I will use two of these readings as the basis for the two questions in the exam for this particular area. As far as the films, I've grouped the films into three topics, and this is what you should review for the final exam. Two movie, the two movies on the Mafia, Little Caesar and The Godfather, so a question based on that will include, would include references to both films, although clearly you don't have to provide an exhaustive treatment of both and you can lean more on one than the other, okay? The second group of films is the films whose main character is Tom Ripley and of course you know they are the talented Mr. Ripley and Ripley's Game, again, a question on this would be focusing on the character and asking you to include references to both films, although, once again, since the essay questions are not that long, you can use one film more extensively than the other and limit the number of connections you want to establish that would be acceptable. And the third 
topic, possible topic for this kind of question would be the two episodes from House of Cards, the BBC version and the American version. Same thing, the question will be more general and you can use one more than the other, one series more than the other to uh, compose your answer to this, okay? So two questions on the prints, two questions on Machiavellian text picked from these fours, one question on films and TV series picked from these three groups, okay? Now, if you have any questions about the final exam, we can talk about, again about that. This would also be a good time if you have any questions about the presentation or your paper to ask those questions. Of course, depending on the nature of the question, I would recommend that you schedule an appointment with me and discuss your uh, specific issues or concerns uh, with me at length, but we can certainly open the floor for any kind of discussion um, before we proceed with uh, today's class. So, the program, while you're thinking about your questions, let me tell you the changes that I've decided. I want to continue with the prints until I'm done. So I'm not going to talk about the new Machiavelli now, and I will at some point next week after I'm done with the chapters of the prints. I will, though, conclude my presentation of the Mandrake route because we did that last week and I only need five or ten minutes to complete the presentation of that play, which is somewhat relevant in a tangential way. It connects to the general ideology of the prince that we have discussed and also this idea that you find represented in this group of texts that Machiavelli's ideas could be applicable to the personal life of individuals and not just to the leaders operating in the field of politics. Today, after the Mandrake group, I will continue from chapter 17 on and I'll do the same on Friday and Monday or even until, until Wednesday as, as much time as needed uh, to complete the examination of the prints and then I'll have either one or one and a half classes to discuss about the new, to talk about the new Machiavelli, okay? Presentations, the schedule of presentations is from Monday, May the 2nd on. And as you know, you can go to the announcement page where you find the link to calendly.com slash Andrea Fedi where you can schedule the Zoom presentation or you can record a presentation and share it with me by May the 13th, okay? You can also, if you want to present in presence in my office, you can schedule an appointment at some point next week or the week after that, there will be a few occasions when I will be on campus even though I don't have Classes. Have you thought of any questions about the final exam, the presentation, or the paper? Yes, Erika. I heard, I remember you mentioned one time that you didn't really want us to do a PowerPoint for the presentation. So how exactly do you want the format for it to be? No, let, let me be more specific. You can have things that you put on slides, talking points, or passages during your live presentation or your discussed presentation, what I was advising against would be a narrated PowerPoint. Like reading off the slides? You don't want that? Of course not. Reading is, is off, right? It's a presentation, so reading would make it practically a paper, a secondary paper, right? But I was saying that it is possible if anyone wants to record and share the presentation it is possible to uh, create a PowerPoint and then to record a narrative, it's called a narration, over the slides. And when one watches that presentation, moving from slide to slide, can press play or the audio starts automatically, etc. 
that kind of format I was advising against, simply. But if you want to have a presentation in which using Zoom or some other kind of software you're familiar with, you put on the screen talking points or quotes, and then you talk about those topics or you analyze those quotes, that would be fine, okay? okay? But that would make it more lively than I have a slide in PowerPoint, I record 60 seconds, and then I move on to the next slide, etc. right? But it's not an issue. If you're not even familiar with the format, of course, you're not going to choose that. I'm saying that because I've had similar formats uh, shared with me in the past, and they don't work particularly well. The narrated PowerPoint format. But if you want to just use the slides and then talk over them while you're recording, that's perfectly fine. Especially if you use uh, Zoom. As I said, it's very simple because you click share on the Zoom app uh, after you record you select, in this case, the PowerPoint where you have prepared talking points and quotes, and you, you go about your presentation, and you are in charge of the presentation. You advance the slides, you talk over, but you do, you do so extemporaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Because as I said, it's not about the, how, how perfect the delivery is or how formal the presentation is, but you're showing your expertise through your ability to talk freely about those topics. It doesn't matter if you need to pause at some point, gather your thoughts and then advance. That's perfectly fine. That happens for real life presentations, okay? Or if you realize that you forgot something and you go back before you move on, that's also perfectly fine. But I want to see you being able to talk in your own language about the book on which you've based your paper and including specific examples. As I said, don't include the basic information that I will expect to find in the paper, in the introduction to the paper. Who's the author uh, or when did the book come out or what was the reception? Those parts are more descriptive. And if there is relevant information that uh, would explain your analysis of a passage, you can pick that out of uh, your uh, selection of topics when you present a passage. But your presentation in this case is mostly a show and tell based on passages or ideas from the book where you show passages or you show a list of talking points illustrating some themes and then you talk how the book incorporates those ideas and to what extent those ideas are Machiavellian. The strength of your examples is the core value of your presentation, not that it goes from uh, an introductory section to a conclusion. Okay? Of course, you can have a short introduction, but make it as short as possible. And of course, you can have a conclusion, but you don't need to because you also have a formal paper that will have all those sections, okay? So presentation and paper complement each other. And your presentation is not a small scale version of your paper, is instead the strongest, more convincing, more interesting ideas from the analysis of the book in your paper. And then your paper is a more systematic, more comprehensive treatment of that book, including some descriptive, some basic uh, descriptive content and basic information. Okay, but in the presentation you go for, you can even start with, when I read this book, this is the example that uh, inspired me to pick this book, that impressed me, or, or that provoked the strongest negative reaction, right, etc. More questions? about the final exam, the presentation, and the paper. Okay, so I'll move on 
in this case, as I said, if you need my assistance, let me know. You know my regular office hours, my virtual office hours, but you can just schedule, especially during the, the next two weeks, you can schedule a Zoom meeting with me on most afternoons. Let me bring down the screen and restart the projector. And I'm going to read together with you some passages from these chapters, offer a few comments, try to connect these uh, passages to the general ideas that I introduced recently or throughout the semester. I will explain some historical or cultural references, but I invite you to interrupt me to ask questions or to offer your own comments and ideas about these passages. Chapter 17 is one of the famous chapters from Machiavelli's The Prince, is one of those chapters that is quoted, referred to more often. The basic idea in this chapter is that in the conventional language, you can use terms such as cruelty or compassion in reference to an ethical system, a system of values inspired by philosophy, by religion, or by social norms. And in any of those three systems, the assumption is that cruelty or compassion only have one interpretation. And that interpretation, that meaning, that application to reality is constant, right? Of course, it changes from system to system, right? Because you can develop different systems of values, right? Different political views, different views of what is moral, what is immoral, based, as I said, on secular culture, based on religion. But within each of those systems, the values assigned to cruelty the criteria that allow you to label something as cruel and the criteria that allow you to label something as compassionate or the synonyms. Of course, you can quickly think of any number of synonyms for cruelty and compassion. Those criteria don't change. What Machiavelli implies through a series of passages where he argues about the topic and a series of examples is that within a Machiavellian system, nothing can be defined cruelty or as cruel or compassionate in a uniform, constant way. Because whether or not a strategy or a social or political or a military practice is good or bad, right? Because we're talking about positive and negative, basically. It all depends on the context and the outcome. The value of these terms, of these labels, it is relative, but not relative, meaning there is no cruelty, there is no compassion. There is, but how you define something as cruel or compassionate, good or bad, all depends on the context. So it is relative, but understand 
that we're not talking about relativism in moral terms. Nothing has value. No, everything has a value that can be positive or negative, but that value can only be determined within a specific context, a place and a time. Whenever you have that context in front of you and you analyze that context, then it becomes clear that certain strategies, behaviors, practices are good and others are bad. And how you establish that within the context? Quite easily. Good is everything that helps you achieve the outcome that is desirable in that context. And usually in a Machiavellian political system, the outcome is related to some issue, some critical issue, some crisis that the leader needs to address, right? To restore power, to maintain power, to gain power in that situation. And of course, by power, more often than not, we mean control of the situation, control over any obstacles, any opponent within that context. So context by context, we can say that, for example, murdering your political opponent may be good, may be compassionate and not cruel, but it depends on the context. Even evil practices, even cruelty by conventional standards is not necessarily the answer. Even that is not always good. That's why we said numerous times, it would be a terrible simplification to say that Machiavelli advocated for the use of evil or the use of cruelty. Not at all. As I said before, Machiavelli, for the modern political game of today, clearly would not advocate for the kind of behavior that Frank Underwood or Francis Urquhart engage on, right? You cannot conceive of a politician murdering people who stand in their way simply to get to their outcome. Because the chances of, being, of their crimes being exposed are too many in this kind of society. Especially, you can think, you can make an exception for the BBC version of House of Cards because it, can, it, it was produced from uh, the early 1990s on. But in today's society, where anyone can turn on a cell phone and make a video of you doing something, not necessarily you uh, throwing uh, someone from a roof, but simply you coming out of a place where murder was committed, and they would take a video simply because you are a celebrity, as some kind of political leader, the kind Francis or Frank, and Francis Urquhart or Frank Underwood are, the risks are too many, and how do you control the media when you have this dispersion, this fragmentation of the media, whereby it's not just controlling a few newspapers, how can you control the millions of users who can post a video on YouTube and that video becomes viral before you can do anything? And even if you stop that video, someone will have made copies of that video. So Machiavelli in a modern day situation would say, stay away from the excessive use of force. Really contemplate the use of force when it is an absolute necessity meaning that there is no other way, because that's the concept of necessity for Machiavelli. And whenever Machiavelli implies that killing your opponents, as in the case of Cesare Borgia, in the famous uh, episode incident of Senigallia, when Cesare Borgia calls his uh, enemies to negotiate a peace agreement and then kills all of them, even in that case, Machiavelli implies that there is a state, a condition of necessity, meaning that given the time that Cesare Borgia has to resolve the crisis posed by the war with his enemies, that is the most expedient and the most efficient way to bring the war to conclusion.
okay? It's just a pragmatic necessity lacking other solutions given the dramatic nature of the crisis faced by Cesare Borgia, who of course has other goals that go beyond conquering the towns of Romagna because Cesare Borgia allegedly wants to expand his state and possibly become the leader of Italy or at least the leader of northern Italy and establish himself as a powerful leader in the Italian peninsula altogether before the other players, including France, the Empire, Spain, uh, create obstacles, impede his path uh, to that ultimate goal. So nothing is positive per se, nothing is negative per se. Evil is not necessarily the solution. It might be negative in a particular context. So everything is relative, but not absolutely relative. Everything is relative to a context. So Machiavelli, talking in general, cannot say in this chapter or in chapter 19, which is related to this one, this is good, this is bad. It depends on the context. Whenever you examine cruelty in a context, in some contexts, cruelty can be a positive. And therefore, you cannot call it cruelty, or in this case, Machiavelli will uh, use circumlocutions and will say poorly use cruelty or, or well use cruelty to say if cruelty helps you achieve a goal that is necessary, that has a positive downfall, then it cannot be defined as, as negative or you can call it cruelty but it has some positive attached to it. But not because it is cruel, but simply because it had a positive effect pragmatically in the context. And from the beginning of the chapter, Machiavelli lets you understand his thought in regard to this. When he says, I say that each prince ought to desire to be reputed compassionate and not cruel. So this is what we said many times. Even though Machiavelli rejects traditional morality within the political game, he understands very well that politics is only one area of reality and that removing morality from that situation doesn't mean that you can ignore morality altogether. Morality is part of society, is part of the human experience. And therefore, you may at the same time as a leader, achieve your goals using evil ways, using cruelty, be successful by the standards of the political game, and at the same time, you may be judged cruel. You may be judged harshly by society, by posterity. And in that sense, I've said, in a way, the leader of Machiavelli is a tragic figure. Tragic also because he may have to resort to cruelty when his nature is not completely aligned with those evil or cruel ways. He may have to force himself to uh, impose drastic measures that will result in the suffering or the death of other people. And this, in fact, this kind of reasoning was then developed into a system that is still applied today, which is the ideology, the system called reason of state, right? Predicated on which the president of the United States may allow uh, the killing by the military, by the secret service of a citizen, not an enemy soldier, a citizen, including an American citizen, although there are more legal implications to that, or a foreign enemy because that is considered to be good for the uh, goals of the state in general and therefore for the well-being of the whole society. Nonetheless, he must be alert not to use his compassion badly. And this is where Machiavelli engages in this game. Bad, good, nothing is bad or good, even though nominally, from the point of view of language, 
cruelty is bad, compassion is good. Cesare Borgia was reputed to be cruel, which is very true. Cesare Borgia was considered to be a monster. If you read the documents about him during the early 1500s, it's kind of like the Antichrist of the period. And there are publications such as the Supplementum Supplementi Chronicarum by Foresti that ends with the episode of Senigallia, ends a book of almost a thousand pages in Latin that chronicles the history of the world from Adam and Eve all the way to the facts of Senigallia, the implication being that the end of time is near. We see things that only the Antichrist would do, such as call people for a peace agreement and then re violate the sanctity of the laws of diplomacy, right? You've invited someone, you've promised them they would be safe and you have no word of honor. You have no honor whatsoever if you kill them. So where, where are we in uh, the, the, what is going on? In, in society, it must be the end of time. So Cesare Borgia was considered to be a monster, not only for all the things he did, but in the anti-Borgia propaganda of the period, he was blamed even for things he never committed. But he did engage in quite a few interesting behaviors. Uh, nonetheless, that cruelty of his restored the Romagna. And that's where Machiavelli is uh, changing the meaning of cruelty because he's attaching something good. Restore the Romagna means restored order in the region of Northeast Italy where he conquered a state, where he established a government. Unified it. Unification, of course, is a positive for Machiavelli because he, what he has in mind is national unification as the end goal. You start by unifying Romania, but the idea is the same way you can unify Italy, and then Italy will be stronger in the European theater, and restored it to peace and faithfulness, right? Peace means stability, faithfulness means that people respect the rules, go by the rules, because again, human nature is flawed, we said before, but the leader will impose boundaries and ensure that people uh, follow the rules for the benefit of society in general. If one considers this well, one will see that he was much more compassionate. And so Machiavelli is plain opposites, right? Than the Florentine people. The Florentine people would be the government of Florence because Florence was for many periods before the Medici's and during Machiavelli's service for the Republic of Florence, a kind of popular democracy, right? Of course, the people who participated in the government were just an elite, the wealthiest elite, about 3,000 people, a couple of percentage points for the general population in a city of about 150,000, 2% would be 3,000, the merchants, the bankers, etc. But the Florentine people means Florence doesn't have a single leader. It's a place where a lot of people uh, are engaged in the game of leadership. The Florentine people who, to avoid the name of cruelty, allowed the destruction of Pistoia. And this is a reference, uh, as I introduced um, on Monday, to the fact that Pistoia, my hometown, was famous for the feuding between two families, the Panciatici and the Cancellieri, and they created factions inside the city. They engaged the support and the alliance of other powerful families in the area, particularly Florence, which is only 20 miles away. And this feuding, including fights, including military skirmishes, went on for a few centuries from the Middle Ages into the 1500s. So the destruction of Pistoia means that the Florentines didn't want to use force to stop the feuding in Pistoia, but is this compassion if the, the result of this was that 
hundreds or thousands of people in that area were killed or suffered. Buildings were destroyed. And to this day, sometimes when you travel around the city of Pistoia or you go in the mountains over Pistoia, you find plates reminding you of the fights, of the skirmishes between supporters of these two families uh, or uh, monuments that were at some point burned down, destroyed during these fights. Okay, so Machiavelli is saying, oh, everyone says Cesare Borgia is cruel because he used force. He killed some of the citizens of Romagna. He tortured some of them. He put to jail some of them. But this was instrumental to restoring peace and order rules for everyone in society. So a few suffered, but society as a whole benefited. The Florentines didn't want to use those harsh measures, but as a result, violence went on in, in the town of Pistoia for 200 years under the Florentines. A prince, therefore, must not care about the infamy of cruelty. So Machiavelli is saying, don't worry about morality within the context of your actions. In keeping his subjects united and faithful, again, faithful means obedient to the rules, for by making a very few, very few exemplary punishments, and this, of course, went on in past society a lot, right? And, and this was presumed to be very effective. You, that's why in past society you would have public executions. And the theater of public executions uh, was um, a whole thing from the rituals of the public executions to the illustrations that circulated of those executions, to the reports that were published of those executions, and the assumption is these examples will make everyone more obedient, will convince everyone that they should uh, follow uh, the rules. And Machiavelli is not unique, he's a man of his times. Of course, these measures were not that effective uh, at um, inducing the citizens to comply with the laws and, and the social norms. So by making a very few exemplary punishments, he will be more compassionate than those who, through too much compassion, permit the disorders that give rise to killings or robberies. For the latter usually harm an entire population, but in the executions ordered by the prince, a particular person is harmed. And keep in mind that the basis, the cultural basis for this kind of reasoning, I don't care, Machiavelli implies, if a few people have to die, is that not every individual has the same kind of dignity. And you understand that from the point of view of someone like Machiavelli and many of the humanists from that period, who believes that only few individuals in society are extraordinary enough, have extraordinary talents, and the rest is sheep. The masses are gregarious in nature, limited in their talents or abilities, right? And so already there is a difference in the value of a human life within the system. This is just the uh, consequence of that kind of thinking, right? It doesn't matter if a few have to die because probably those few are not significant are not particularly relevant for the whole community. Now, even significant individuals may have to die as part of the political game because the game of leadership is a competitive game. So sometimes even those extraordinary individuals will be killed by someone else who's simply uh, more powerful in terms of leadership or more skilled. And of course, Machiavelli at the end of this paragraph mentions the new princes, he always has a particular appreciation for the kind of situation encountered by a new prince, because the overall goal that Machiavelli has in mind for this pamphlet, for this short book, is we need a new prince to unify Italy. So constantly he refers to the peculiar situation encountered 
by new prints making exceptions for that kind of situation. Of course, there is still, whenever Machiavelli talks about the use of force, especially the extreme use of force, the reminder that you have to be careful not to create too much fear because that can generate distrust or hatred. The next passage is the passage on which the dialogue between Sonny and Calogero in A Bronx Tale was based, right? And that dialogue was almost verbatim lifted from the prince. In fact, I can tell you that I just discovered a YouTube channel. Apparently, there is a whole niche in YouTube uh, that I didn't know anything about until a month ago, uh, whereby uh, former or alleged former mafia members uh, create their own YouTube channels to talk about the mafia, to talk, to, uh, uh, talk about uh, mafia stories. Wow. Some of those are BS. Uh, some of, of those clearly uh, have, have a made-up uh, reputation, right? A good example of that would be Gianni Russo, who also acted in The Godfather and the First Godfather, some have a record, right? So there are trial uh, documents proving that they were members of the Mafia. They were uh, convicted based on the RICO statute, such as Michael Francis. Now, Michael Francis uh, interviewed a month ago Chaspa Minteri, and of course they talked also about a Bronx tale, and they had a disagreement about this passage, because Michael Francis says, I have to tell you something I didn't like. When you talk in the movie about love and fear, and you say it's better to be feared, I don't agree with that. If I acted, if I was loyal to my capos, uh, when I was in the life, he calls it the life, um, it was because I loved them. Of course, I was afraid of the repercussions. I took an oath to be, to be loyal to the rules of the organization, etc. but love was the primary driving force for me, and I was expecting Chas Palminteri to respond, look, it's not really this. The dialogue is based on Machiavelli. No, not at all. Uh, Palminteri himself says, no, well, we're saying the same thing. Uh, 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 because both love and fear are important, etc and in a way is introducing a Machiavellian concept, because even Machiavelli, as I said, isn't really picking the winning value, the positive value between fear and love, because you know, we've said it many times, that both are necessary in order for a leader to be successful. You cannot base your power, your leadership just on fear, but Machiavelli is saying really only fear is reliable and love is useful, but just be careful not to rely on love because love is not predictable. You have no control over the cooperative, collaborative compliance by your citizens, but you have a lot of control over fear because fear is induced by strategies and with the use of soldiers and, and armed uh, uh, collaborators that you can control predictably, not absolutely. It's never 100%, but much more predictably. But who knows, maybe so much time has gone by that Chas Palminteri has forgotten that he based the script. The script is by Palminteri himself. Originally, the film was a play staged for, for theater. Uh, he has forgotten uh, that he based that dialogue on um, the uh, on the prince itself, on, on this very uh, paragraph. From the above, a debate arises whether it is better to be loved than feared or the contrary. The answer is that one would want to be both the one and the other. But because it is difficult to join them together, you cannot have both of them equally at the same time. Sometimes you lean more on the use of force. Sometimes you lean more on the use of influence. Both will be represented, but in, different, in a different ratio. If one has to do with, without one of the two, it is much safer 
that's the re reliability that I was talking about before, to be feared and loved, for the following may be said generally about men. And this is one other passage connected to the passage we read, passages we read uh, on Monday about the, uh, how flawed human nature is, right? One of the many passages where Machiavelli has the most negative things to say about humans, that they are ungrateful, changeable, pretenders and dissemblers, avoiders of dangers, desirous of gain, and while you do them good, they're wholly yours, offering you their blood, their property, their life, and their children, as I said above. When the need is far off, but when it comes close to you, they revolt. So they pretend to, offer it, to be offering everything to you when there is no risk for them. When there is an actual risk for them, then they're not with you at all. And that prince who has founded himself wholly on their words because he finds himself naked of other preparations is ruined. For the friendships that are acquired at a price and not with greatness and nobility of spirit are paid for, but they are not owned. Again, you can rely on love, on influence, and at their expiration, they cannot be used, etc. I will now switch, as promised, to the presentation on the mandrake root to bring this also to a conclusion. This is more or less where we got. So keep in mind, we're talking about a play that tells the story of a student from Florence who goes to the University of Paris, comes back, is wealthy, is not very productive, not a productive member of society for sure. And he is in love with, infatuated with, a married woman, Lucrezia, and he would like to have sex with her. He managed, manages to do so with the help of his servant, Ciro, and another social parasite called uh, Ligurio. They come up with this idea. They will approach the, the old husband of Lucrezia, who's young and beautiful, and they cannot have, they haven't had children. He's too old, possibly, to do so. And they promise Nietzsche, the husband, a medical, magical solution. A potion made with the root of the mandrake, which will make Lucrezia fertile, but will also be poisonous to the first man who has sex with her. The secondary solution is that they will grab someone from the streets of Florence one night, place this person in the bedroom of Lucrezia, convince Lucrezia that she has to have sex with this man because this is instrumental to her and her husband uh, having a, conceiving a child. And this man, this random stranger, grabbed from the streets of Florence at night when few people are around in a city during that time is in fact Callimaco in disguise. And Callimaco will explain to Lucrezia what is going on, what is happening when he's taken to her bedroom and they agree to have sex and to continue their sexual affair even after that night. And of course, you can imagine that a child eventually will be conceived, but won't be Messer Nietzsche's child. So it's interesting that we find Machiavelli engaging in the plights, with the plights, the goals, the desires, the strategies of individuals in society. So is Machiavelli himself trying to create Machiavellian characters? And to what extent he managed to transfer his ideology into the comedy? Not so much, really. 
which confirms that Machiavelli understood that Machiavellianism is made for leadership, is made for people who are high enough in society that they don't have to fear repercussions when they violate moral rules, because essentially they can manipulate the rules. There is no authority overseeing their actions. And once you deal with citizens, regular citizens, yes, they can be Machiavellian to a degree, but they themselves are limited by the boundaries that any citizen has to deal with, right? They themselves uh, have to be afraid of repercussions. So it's not this comedy about Machiavellian games applied to the personal lives of the characters and outside of, so of society. This is a very small scale version. These are small games. And therefore, I wouldn't call what Kalima does in order to have sex with Lucrezia, which is his goal, a Machiavellian strategy. And my uh, contention, my suggestion, is that this is something that we can call edging. A Machiavellian game creates a result that, as we said at the beginning of the semester, can be predictive. So the, the result is predictable, it's not sure, but it's predictable, it will happen in most instances. It's necessary, it's repeatable. These things are not really applicable entirely to the games played by the characters. Edging is simply gaining an advantage, right? So with edging, you're cheating in order to improve your chances. But repeatability, predictability, necessity are not a big part of this situation, of this strategy. Edging means that you have a few points percentage-wise over other players in the game, but not enough points to ensure predictability, okay? Meaning that you will obtain your goal more often, slightly more often, than others in the game who don't go by the same strategy, don't rely on the same strategies. Whereas a true Machiavellian strategy will predictably ensure that you reach that goal. So it's not just a few times more than the average player, it should be a, a considerable advantage over any other who doesn't rely on those strategies. Of course, uh, there is a Machiavellian component in the fact that at least two of the characters, the student and the young woman, lose their innocence, become aware of the fact that you can be Machiavellian and use some Machiavellianism to your advantage. Lucrezia, at the beginning of the play, is apparently, allegedly, an honest, loyal wife and also someone who goes to church and complies with the rules of religion. By the end of the play, she's opened her eyes and seen that even people around her, including her mother, uh, the, the, her confessor, are not as honest and sincere. They're all Machiavellian to a degree, okay? And so they decide to do the pragmatic thing. We'll have sex this night and why not continue? Since, since this is to our mutual advantage, right? Kalimaco, because he's in love with Lucrezia, if you want to call it love. And Lucrezia, because after all, she's married to an old man who's also a fool. And she has, as an alternative, as uh, an alternative within her reach, a younger man, more attractive and uh, more pleasant altogether. Right? Not, not as boring as her husband. So, an authentic Machiavellian game is played by anyone who has some control over the rules of the game. That's why politicians and mafia leaders can engage in a Machiavellian game, because even the, the mafia leaders are connected 
right, to local politicians or judges or the police. So they don't have to face the repercussions of their behaviors as much as a regular criminal. And in an authentic Machiavellian game, you find direct and indirect power, force, and influence in any kind of private application of the game, force is reduced. And edging is uh, different. You're, you're still limited by the same social boundaries as any other player. You have no control over the rules of the game altogether. And whatever you achieve is limited in terms of the outcome, right? Such as I'll be able to have a sexual affair with a woman I desire.